So here I'm taking a bit of inspiration from a previous video I did that got kind of a lot of views and is pretty popular, and that is find a function whose derivative is his inverse. So today we're gonna to do something, like I said, similar to that, but here we'll find a function whose inverse is its antiderivative. And this is like kind of a playful calculation. This shouldn't be seen as something like super careful and we're not gonna do a big classification or anything. We're just gonna exhibit this happening once. And we'll start with the hypothesis and that is that we should be able to find a function of the following form. So often people are a little off put by this kind of guessing, but truth be told, it's pretty common. Okay, so we're starting with a function of the form c times x to the a, and then we'll just build an equation for c and a out of this condition. Well, let's calculate the inverse function first. So if we've got f of x equals c times x to the a, then by a fairly straightforward calculation, we can see that f inverse of x is in fact x over c to the one over a. Now we can check that if we'd like, and maybe we'll check one of the compositions just to make sure that we're right. So let's do f composed with what I've called f inverse. So that's gonna be f with this object inside. So we've got x over c to the one over a. But let's see what our function f does. So it raises x to the eighth power. So this means it raises this argument to the eighth power and then multiplies by c. So we've got c times x over c to the one over a all to the a power. But it's pretty clear if we unravel that from inside out, we'll just get x, which is the identity function. So this gives us some evidence that we have found the inverse function. In fact, we would also need to check f inverse composed with f, but I'll leave that to you guys if you want to do that. Okay, so now let's also calculate the antiderivative. So we've got the antiderivative or the integral from zero to x. So notice that's like the careful way of writing down the antiderivative. You introduce this dummy variable here and then you put your variable in the exponent. So we've got the integral from zero to x of f of t dt, but that's gonna be c times t to the a dt. We can just use the power rule on this. So that means we increase the exponent by one and then divide by the new exponent. That leaves us with c over a plus one times t to the a plus one. We evaluate that from zero to x and that leaves us with c over a plus one times x to the a plus one. So we wanna impose the condition that f inverse is equal to the antiderivative of f. That means we wanna impose the condition that those two things in purple boxes are equal. And that's what we'll start the next board with. So by making this assumption on the shape of f and imposing this equality, we came up with the following equation that we should be able to solve for a and c. And since it's only a single equation, we should only be able to solve for one of the variables. But notice this is not a single equation. This is for all appropriate x in the domain. Now maybe post in the comments which domain you think that we are solving this over. I think that'll maybe be interested to see what people come up with. I have one in mind, but maybe that's not the only one. Okay, so that means we've got infinitely many equations here. That's definitely enough to solve for both C and A. So in particular, the power of X needs to be the same on both sides of this equation. So on the left-hand side of the equation, the power of x is a plus 1. On the right-hand side, it is 1 over a. Okay, but that gives us the quadratic equation, a squared plus a equals 1, which is actually pretty similar to the quadratic equation that gives us the golden ratio which we'll see that the numbers that we come up with are kind of related to the golden ratio. Okay, so furthering this, we get a squared plus a minus one equals zero, and now we can solve for a. 
We will in fact get two values of a from the quadratic equation, but I just want to find a function, not all functions. So I'll just take one of the roots here. And the root that I'll take is minus one plus root five over two. Okay, so we can get that just using the quadratic formula on this quadratic equation in A. So now we've got our value for A. We can impose the condition that the coefficients of x to this power on either side of the equation need to be the same. So in other words, we have c over a plus one, because that's the coefficient of the variable on the left-hand side, must be equal to one over c to the one over a, which is the coefficient on the right-hand side. Okay, so where can we go from there? Well, since a is a little bit complicated, maybe we should leave a in there and solve c in terms of a. So let's start by cross multiplying, and that will give us c to the one plus one over a, when we multiply this up here, equals a plus one. Next, let's combine these together by finding a common denominator. That'll give us c to the a plus one over a, equals a plus one, but let's notice that a plus one will just turn this minus one into a plus one, so we'll have one plus the square root of five over two, which is the golden ratio, and I will denote that as phi. So that's pretty interesting. Now I think we can simplify this a little bit as well. We have a plus one over a, but notice that's the same thing as one over a times a plus one, but one over a times a plus one is the same thing as a plus one squared because those are both equal. So that gives us c to the a plus one squared equals phi. And now playing the same game that we did before where we noticed a plus one was the golden ratio of phi, we see that c to the phi squared is equal to phi. In other words, c is equal to the phi squared root of phi. So I think that's a pretty nice result. So let's see, we've got a value of c and we have a value for a. So let's start the next board with our equation written down and then we'll just check that everything works. Via some calculations on the last board, it seemed like the following function will satisfy this blue boxed equation. So we've got f of x is the phi squared root of phi times x to the phi minus one, where I've changed this exponent to be in terms of phi using the fact that phi minus one is minus one plus root five over two, which is an easy calculation from what we saw before. Let's also recall that a defining characteristic of the golden ratio is that phi squared is equal to phi plus one. So that might come into use as we check this. Okay, so speaking of, let's go ahead and check this. Let's first take the antiderivative. So if we do the integral from zero to x of the phi squared root of phi x to the phi minus one dx, we'll see that we increase the exponent by one and then divide by the new exponent. So let's see, that's gonna give us the phi squared root of phi divided by phi minus one plus one, but that's just phi and then we have x to the phi. But now let's compare that to the inverse function. So let's see, the inverse function will be x over this constant. So let's write that constant down. It's a little bit of a mouthful and then to the inverse of this power. So that'll be one over phi minus one like this. But now let's see if we can simplify these things a little bit until they look the same. So now let's expand this out a little bit. So we'll have one over, so this is now going to be phi to the power of one over phi cubed minus phi. So that's what we get from maybe distributing this exponent here to this root here and then writing them both as exponents. And then next we have x to the one over phi minus one, like that. And now in order for these to be equal, the exponents of x have to be equal and the coefficients have to be equal. Let's talk through why these exponents are equal first. 
So let's take this defining property of phi and then change it around a little bit. So notice that we can rewrite this as phi squared minus phi equals one, factor a phi out and we have phi times phi minus one equals one. But then dividing by phi minus one, we see that phi is equal to one over one minus phi. So that's good to know. That means we can take this exponent right here, erase what we had and replace it with phi. So now these exponents line up. So that's good. And now through a similar process, which is only just a little bit more involved, we can show that these two coefficients are the same as well. But I'll maybe leave that as a nice little homework exercise. And that's a good place to stop.